So what I want to speak about is the question of why we should be more inclusive in the arts. But I want to talk about it in a way that I don't hear when people trot out the now very problematic term diversity. For me, a lot of arguments for inclusion fail to address why art is important and unique in the first place, what impact it has on individuals, and why having a wide group of artists involved serves to benefit everyone. So when I think about how I've come to understand the world around me, I like to use the metaphor of the cosmos, which is why I chose this slide, which shows an image from the Hubble Space Telescope of a galaxy approximately 400 million light years away. I like to think that I am swimming in a universe of possibility. Each star or planet or solar system has been given to me by every interaction that I've ever had with another person. Every lesson I've learned, every book I've read, every work of art that I've seen or heard. Each of these interactions with the thoughts and ideas of another person, no matter how seemingly insignificant, has added a point of light to my expanding understanding. And most importantly, has added to my sense of what is possible. So, I'm a military brat. My father was in the army. This means I moved around a lot when I was a kid. And as a kid, and even as a grown up, moving to a new city, even if you speak the same language, can seem like navigating an entirely new world. It feels scary and overwhelming, but it also represents an opportunity, a chance to do something differently. There were definitely times when I took advantage of these opportunities to fib to the new people that I met about who I was or where I came from. But more often than not, I used these moves as a chance to figure out how I could change, what new possibilities I wanted to try out. You see, in addition to being a military kid, I also had a highly developed sense of imagination, which was thanks in large part to my mother who diligently read to me and told me bedtime stories for many, many years. She was an excellent reader, and the stories she invented were sometimes even better than the books. And when she would leave my room at night, if I wasn't already asleep, I would stand up on my bed in the dark, and using my sheets and blankets, I would make elaborate costumes for myself, literally trying on new identities, imagining that my bed was no longer just a mattress covered in rumpled sheets and stuffed animals, but was instead a royal court, or a dark forest, or a long road in the desert. Imaginative play, which is directly linked to the arts, allows us the chance to try out possibilities that we dream up, or that we hear about in stories. What all that moving, and all those stories, and all that time spent awake on top of my bed did for me, was helped me to understand that there are thousands, if not millions, of different ways to be in the world, to feel, to think, and to behave. As you might imagine, with all those stories and all that moving, I spent a good chunk of my life reading books. I read like crazy as soon as I learned how. The same was true of writing. The day I learned how to string words together into sentences, I started scrawling out stories and jotting down my thoughts onto every spare piece of paper I could find. I have always felt a sense of searching when it comes to reading and writing, searching out ideas in particular, where they come from and how they influence our actions and our beliefs. In fact, I became so interested in ideas that I decided to go back to school after a few years of working and get a graduate degree in philosophy of science. It was a rigorous program full of very analytic thinkers. Everything turned back on logic and mathematics and finding evidence and proof for your ideas. And frankly, the program didn't work for me and I started to get frustrated. I remember walking around one of the big parks in London with a, with a classmate, classmate of mine trying to explain to him and to myself why the press program wasn't working for me. And I ended up saying this, I can't ask the questions that I want to ask this way. He didn't understand. He wanted examples of the questions that I wanted to ask that philosophy couldn't address. Um, I'm pretty sure I just changed the subject. But I have returned to that idea many times since then. 
I can't ask the questions that I want to ask this way. So ultimately, art is the combination of content and form. If a horse and its role in the lives of prehistoric humans is the content, then a charcoal drawing on the rock walls of a cave is the form that the artist gives to it. Just like in this photograph of a drawing from the Chauvet Caves in France, which is approximately 30,000 years old. This combination provides a couple of important things for both the artist and the viewer. First, it offers a new possibility, literally, a new form for an idea. And secondly, it provides a unique way of communicating that isn't limited to language. Form allows for depth in communication. It allows ideas to inhabit space and time and to have layers in a way that literal linguistic descriptions alone can never accomplish. That artistic marriage of form and content can be seen in everything from cave drawings to symphonies to complex stage productions and even novels, which employ metaphor and rich description to engage with the reader's imagination. What's central to every art form is a desire to communicate and a willingness to explore. Because what art allows us to do is ask questions about the world and ourselves in ways that we cannot ask in other fields which goes back to that frustration I had with my philosophy program and my sense that I couldn't ask the questions that I wanted to ask that way. What art has allowed me and others to do is to inquire about the world without being limited to facts or logic or notions of objective truth. I can explore everything from what's going on inside my head or my heart to fantasy or spiritual realms or even periods of history in places that I've never experienced but that I have a great curiosity about. Artists are inquirers who show us new possibilities, who show us that we have many options. And oddly enough, one of the strongest proofs for this is the behavior of totalitarian governments and repressive groups of all kinds towards artists and writers. They try to hide or eliminate artists and writers who think differently than them precisely because those artists demonstrate so clearly that there are other ways to think and to live. And even in less obviously repressive countries, artists are treated with suspicion by those who want everyone to share their beliefs because artists often show us that what appears to be the norm does not apply to everyone, and in most cases, does not apply to most people. It's also worth noting that artists are not limited to positive visions. Sometimes artists show us our worst side, the side of humanity that we might prefer not to see. They sometimes illuminate the inner workings and humanity of individuals we would prefer to think that we are not similar to in any way. Artists look into all of it, because without looking, without showing, without asking these questions and sharing what we find, we remain trapped. When you live in a world that offers you very few ways of being, and you don't fit with any of those, then we know too well that your life will not be an easy one. So I wanted to take a second to show this slide which is from a project called Ecstatic Resistance by the artist Emily Roysden. And I've chosen it because while it's somewhat puzzling on first, uh, first glance, it's actually grappling with ideas of difference and change. And a lot of what she's exploring is very relevant to some of the ideas I'm talking about. But if an artist's job is to explore and inquire and help to expand the realm of the possible, then the only way for the arts to remain vital, relevant, and valuable to society is, is to make sure that a wide group of artists is looking into a wide group of questions. Unfortunately, the current reality is that many arts institutions and funders are often worse 
and other sectors when it comes to women and minorities finding opportunity and support for their work in the arts. I'll spare you the long litany of statistics, but I will say what all the statistics make clear is that despite a period of increasing inclusion, in the past couple of decades, in many cases, things have either stagnated or gotten worse. You'll often hear in response to calls for inclusion a complaint that tickets won't sell or that audiences won't show up. And there will be a lot of hand wringing and excuses blamed on the immovable bottom line. But if you run or work in an arts organization and find yourself leaning on the bottom line as an excuse for not being inclusive and expansive in your programming, then you need to change your model, the model that you're operating under. You need to expand your own realm of possibility. Because the reality is that there are plenty of examples of organizations that successfully support and present work by an array of artists. Talk to them, learn how they do it, and figure out how you can adapt their model or make new ones all your own. Find ways to entertain new identities for your organization <clears throat> that will allow you to change. Stay up at night trying on new costumes and new storylines. Use your imagination. And never shy away from the idea of getting smaller. Infinite growth and maintaining unreasonably large goals almost never leads to the support of expansive and rigorous art. So throughout my life, the arts have played an essential role in increasing my universe, both as a person making creative work and as an audience to it. And I've also seen the arts accomplish the same thing for entire communities and countries. This simple marriage of content and form offers us the chance to see and feel connections to people that we do not know, to view the world from unfamiliar perspectives or in entirely new ways, and to encounter and accept difference, all of which have powerful implications for our everyday lives as well as our future. Showing only one or two ways of being or thinking only serves to contract the world. It's time for arts institutions and funders to reimagine themselves in a way that embraces the reality of a world comprised of countless variations and infinite possibility. Thank you.